modernizing the social security number and how it relates to uh, better authentication of identity. One of the things we've learned in the two or three decades we've been doing this is that the SSN, the social security number, is the crucial part of any identification system. So we have a, a pretty full agenda today. I think it'll be a fairly open discussion, um, but the first remarks will come from uh, Congressman Sam Johnson, who's the chairman of the House Committee on the Social Security Subcommittee and the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, his bio is on the web. I'm not going to read it all because it's amazing. I mean, they told me there's nothing in here I can't say, but the guy who set up to Air Director of Air Force Top Gun School, that's amazing, right? So an incredible career, a long service in the Congress, and we're very pleased that he could make it here today. Oops, sorry. No, that's okay. After you've been in government for a while, you kind of walk around crazy. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. You know, uh, protecting Americans from identity theft is a top priority of mine as chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee and has been for many years. <clears throat> we all know Social Security numbers are key to someone's identity and that they are used for just about everything, I guess, you need one. When you, you need one when you get a job, you need one when you buy a house, you need one when you open a credit card. Given all the ways we use Social Security numbers, it's no wonder they're a valuable target for identity theft. For a long time, all we had to do was keep our Social Security numbers safe, was to keep them secret. With this in mind, I have worked as a chairman to limit the use of Social Security numbers. For example, I'm proud to say military IDs no longer use Social Security numbers. That's a real change. Even better, thanks to a bill I got signed into law, Medicare is now sending new cards to seniors, cards that won't feature their Social Security number. Also, I want to note that Congress passed a bill into law last year to require all federal agencies to stop mailing documents that contain social security numbers unless it's absolutely necessary. These are great steps to protect folks from having their social security numbers stolen, but as times have changed, so have the tactics being used by identity theft thieves. Hundreds of millions of social security numbers have been lost in high profile data breaches making it clear we can't count on these numbers being secret anymore. And as we will hear today, this has been a serious implication for being able to identify a person online. Make no mistake, it's still important to limit the use of these numbers, but if we want to keep up with the identity thieves, we also need to go on the offensive and make these numbers less useful less useful to fraudsters in the first place that starts by changing how we use them these numbers are valuable because they're used to both identify someone and to prove their identity this practice doesn't make sense but it's been going on for years we need to break this link between identification and authentication. Earlier this year, I held a hearing before the Social Security Subcommittee to identify ways to do just that. It's time to consider whether the Social Security Administration needs to rethink its approach to the Social Security number. And that includes whether these numbers should be public information, just like your name or date of birth is today. These are big changes and it's going to require thoughtful discussion with public stakeholders as well as the private sector, 
in order to make sure we're meeting today's challenges in a sustainable way. Today's event is an important step in the right direction and I'm glad to be here and look forward to continuing to work with all of you to find effective solutions. Americans want, need, and deserve nothing less. Thank you all for being here with me this morning. Again for doing this. It's Thank really great. You. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. So we do have a we do have a, a a little bit of a contest going on here, and the congressman chose not to do it. But we're waiting to see who the first person is to mention blockchain, uh, and so we've we've you win. done. You win. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I don't over. count because I'm the moderator. But um, uh, we've noticed that if you uh, if you can work blockchain into the title, your 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 number of hits goes up by about 20%. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was one of our goals for the year, and we didn't do it in this report. Um, but the next speaker will be uh, Candace Worley. Candace is an old friend of CSIS. She's been here several times. Um, some of her uh, previous attendances have been among the best we've ever had in Thank terms you. of online so presence. Much. So we're really grateful that she showed up. She's the Vice President and Chief Technical Strategist for McAfee. Um, she manages a worldwide team of technical strategists and prior to that, am I allowed to say Intel? I guess so. Sure. She was the Vice President for Enterprise Solutions when McAfee and Intel were uh, joined together. So we're very grateful for her to be here and to make some Great. remarks. Thank you so uh, much, Jim. Good morning. <clears throat> and I, uh, I am sorry that the, the chairman left. I would have loved to have thanked him not only for his service to our country, but also to uh, one of the districts in which uh, we have a large presence as a company. So he's been a great contributor to the cause of kind of social security number and identity and determining how we move forward with this particular challenge. You know, being in the security industry, I, I'm about 18 and a half years in this industry now. It's no secret that identity thieves will take every advantage to compromise an individual's identity for their own um, profit, for their own gain, whether that be a nation state, whether that be an individual hacktivist, whatever it might be. And as we think about the social security number in the report, we actually indicate that somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of all social security numbers have been compromised at this point. It is no longer a secure identifier for American citizens. You can't have 80% of your numbers compromised and continue to consider it a secure form of identity. And yet, as a nation, we continue to leverage it as the primary form of identifier for every individual. So as we contemplate how we move forward to try to solve this particular challenge, we need to look at different ways in which we can potentially introduce a second level of authentication or some other approach to the social security number. And things have been tried in the past. Many other countries have already taken a look at this and implemented uh, programs to enable some sort of um, ID number. Now here in the US, we have a little bit of a visceral reaction to the idea of a national ID because of the privacy concerns around that. And certainly as we look at some of the ways in which this has been approached in other countries, I think most Americans would take exception to that. In some cases, countries have leveraged biometrics where now that biometric is a part of a national database. That might cause concern here. And yet in other countries, they've leveraged financial institutions that are also considered sort of a trusted, um, uh, authority, much like the government is here, to kind of drive that identification program. In the report, we talk about a number of technologies that might be leveraged as a basis for some form of digital identity. 
could be forms of PKI, could be biometrics, could be blockchain. That was actually talked about in the reports uh, a little bit. <laughs> you can pay me later. Um, and, and you know, I think that the way we landed in the report um, was really that, that a smart card approach may be the most viable option. Now we want to leave it a little bit open and make sure that as new technologies get introduced into the market, there's an opportunity for us to evolve this ID approach to leverage technologies that might uh, deliver a better authentication experience for the user and better authentication in terms of its security. And so, you know, as, as kind of a player in the security space, but not a player in the identity space, just to be clear, um, we believe that extensibility and scalability are going to be two core requirements that have to be taken into consideration whatever solution we come up with. Scalability in that the Social Security Administration delivers about 5 million new Social Security cards every year. If we continue to grow as a population, whatever we build for this program has got to scale as those numbers continue to grow and extensible so that as private industry continues to evolve the technology available to us, they can innovate on new ways of delivering a more secure ID experience to our end users. And then from an end user and a commerce perspective, I think it's important to say that end users adopt things that are easy. So if we can't create a system that one, they don't have to work very hard, to, to learn and to live with every day, and two, they're not comfortable with it, it won't actually get adopted because we'll see kind of resistance from the people who were in fact creating a system to protect. And so I think to that end, the smart card proposal that a, a CSIS has come up with in this report is actually a very viable um, option for the short term as we think about customer, excuse me, clients and, and uh, clients of companies as well as consumers are comfortable with pin and chip now. Almost every one of our credit cards now has that. So we've kind of become accustomed to that smart card approach to doing business. And we believe that consumers would adopt that sort of approach to this challenge. And as long as cre we create the back end systems on the commerce and the government end that enable us to evolve this approach as new technology becomes available, we believe that it's a very viable short-term opportunity. The reality is we can't live with what we have right now. We can't continue to live with an identifier that's also an authenticator that we all know is no longer secure. So we as a government, as industry, as consumers need to work together to find a solution to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce our other panelists. Thank you, Candace. That was uh, helpful. Go ahead. Sure. Um, we have uh, Naomi Lefkowitz, who's the Senior Privacy Policy Analyst at NIST. I think NIST is doing some really interesting work on this. So if you look at where progress is being made, um, some of the NIST work is uh, important for this. And as we all know from those of us like Paul and Candace who've been doing this for a long time, privacy is one of the chief, I would call it obstacles, but others might call it chief requirements for getting better authentication in the US. Um, Paul Rosenstreig, an old friend, uh, they don't have your bio here, but I can just make Why it not? up, can't I? <laughs> Paul has extensive federal experience, plus a, a long time uh, uh, analyst and speaker in this field. So we have a great panel. This is going to be very interactive, so I'm going to start with a couple questions and we're going to get see what you guys have to say. Uh, we'll see what we see where we go. But um, why don't you tell me where you think we are? We can start with Paul. We'll give Candace a rest. Where are we when it comes to authentication in, in this country? When it comes to authentication of identity, yes. we are, um, you can't go below zero, can you? Yes, you can. Uh, no, uh, we are not doing a, a, a great job. Um, most of the methodologies that we have in existence today are legacy authentication systems, like the social security number, that are <coughs> no longer uh, realistically viable. I mean, I, I think the arc of the history that, that Congressman Johnson charted was exactly right, which was originally social security number was a pretty legitimate 
authenticator. It was something that you knew that nobody else knew that was a kind of universally uh, recognized formatted password, if you will, to your full identification. And so for much of his career, uh, he worked quite rightly, I think, to maintain the security and, and viability of social security numbers as authenticators by, by maintaining their secrecy, by limiting their use to, to uh, situations in which it was essential. Uh, and, and thus, um, as, as your report says, yeah, and as Candace mentioned, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of those are, are, are uh, compromised at this point. I, I actually think that that's a low number. Um, my, my, my guess is that um, if you gave me a week and a decent budget, I could get any secu social security number in America from somewhere. Um, it might take a little bit of uh, compromise uh, of active measures, but I think most of them are, are out. So, so, so that leaves us to the question of where to go next. And, uh, you know, Candace again, I think, was right to emphasize the smart card as a as a short term measure. Uh, I'm perhaps a little more skeptical than you about about its viability, even in the short term. And we can talk about that as we go forward, if you want. But it's clear, I think, that in a long term, we need to find a different uh, a different uh, authentication methodology, and I'm going to submit a different authenticator, which is to say that the largest problem, you, you called it a challenge or, or a, uh, to, uh, to authentication is the privacy conundrum, and the biggest barrier there conceptually is that people don't accept the government as authenticator as readily as they would perhaps some private organization or some organization in which they repose greater confidence. Um, and we can also talk about whether or not that, that predilection in American society, which as Candace again correctly said, is, is deeply ingrained, um, is, is a legitimate one, but it's the reality that I think is going to drive us uh, towards new solutions. So where we are right now, um, I, I have almost no confidence in the security of most of my authentication methodologies. Um, and I work very hard at them. <laughs> and, uh, and we're on the cusp of a need to make some real realistic uh, changes uh, that will hopefully give everybody a bit more confidence. Paul touched on something really important. And so before I ask uh, Naomi to say a few words, let me um, tell you a story about when I was a kid. One of our many authentication efforts in the US involved uh, the idea, just this idea, that you wanted a trusted third party that would be a commercial vendor of authentication services. And so my job was to go around and ask big companies. It was a hilarious experience, because yes, like, it turns out, who knew that the, the, the secret to Rice Krispies was like so crucial that people were always trying to steal it. And so the, whoever, is it Kellogg's that makes Rice Krispies? Mm -hmm. They said, for us, there's no such thing as a trusted third party. And I heard that from every company I talked to. So here's our problem. And so I want to get to privacy with Naomi, but people don't want an intrusive government solution, but they also aren't comfortable with a commercial solution. And we can talk about why that is. So something has to be foundational, I would say, located in a government credential. And then you have to figure out how to translate that into some commercial activity. But that was really a shock to me, as it turns out every company has some secret and that they were not willing to let any third party get their hands on. And that included authentication of identity. But Paul, you touched on privacy. Privacy has been one of the drivers in this debate from the beginning. Uh, I won't tell you all the times that we've seen solutions to authentication of identity sort of run into the what you could call the brick wall of privacy. And I'm being a little negative here, you have these very real concerns to protect privacy. And Naomi, I wonder if you want, wonder if you want to talk to that for a little bit. Sure. So I think it's helpful to think about the relationship between identity and privacy mm -hmm. as almost like a double-edged sword, right? So stronger uh, identity and authentication actually helps protect your privacy, right, from a mm -hmm. security standpoint in terms of, you know, 
blocking access to sensitive information. Um, but depending on how you set up your identification system, right, you can create real privacy risks around, you know, more invasive tracking and profiling with stronger identities. So the, you know, the direction that we've taken at NIST is to try to, you know, maximize the, the beneficial part, the data security part, while uh, minimizing uh, the invasive part. Uh, so we've really gone in a direction of, of privacy risk management and privacy engineering, where you're um, trying to find that sort of optimal uh, spot. Uh, and, and so we've done a number of pilots and, you know, looking at a set of principles that we wanted these pilots to demonstrate. So both um, interoperability, which I think is referring to where you said, uh, you know, actually we think there's a range of people's views on trust, right? And so, and as Candace has rightfully said, um, you know, sort of this centralized government identity has always been sort of the third rail on <laughs> identity. So, uh, so we had gone in a direction of sort of having this marketplace of choice, right? So this is not uh, atypical for, um, you know, sort of the, the Anglo countries, right? Like UK and Canada and Australia and the US, uh, where we don't have these centralized identity systems. Uh, and so, so you could have identity coming out of the government, but you could also have identity coming out of various commercial uh, entities and people would have a choice, right? And so in order to have a system like that, though, you need this interoperable federated structure where you can have these trust relationships between the assertions. Uh, and that's really where the issues around privacy come in, right? Because now you have sort of, you know, uh, commercial entities knowing that you're maybe going and using a credential at a government and getting a benefit and although they don't know exactly what you're doing there all of a sudden they know a lot more information it's as if you know you were showing your driver's license and the DMV suddenly knew all the places that you were using your driver's license so um, there are actually technical um, methods to actually break that linkage but still get that trust there's um, uh, cryptographic protocols called zero knowledge proof cryptography um, and you know this is some of the things that we tried to explore with pilots and what we actually learned um, was that you know the theory is great but the the identity protocols on which these assertions run uh, had never contemplated this kind of you know um, protection for for privacy and so there was actually literally like no fields where you could put the keys without breaking these standards these protocols uh, so we have um, you know we're now taking a direction of moving towards more um, you know work in the standards development space so that we can actually develop technical standards that uh, integrate privacy uh, into them. Who are you working with when you're developing those standards? Uh, so we're working in ISO uh, and also uh, we work with FIDO um, and IEEE and uh, you know basically the basic standards development organization. Which of the, what's the best thing that's come out of the pilots when you think about this? What's your best lesson from the pilot programs? Which is the best pilot? <laughs> um, you know, it's like pick, picking your favorite child. Yes, <laughs> you can pick more than one, but. Uh. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's just been, you know, from a privacy standpoint, it was, I, it's not surprising, but it was just sort of fascinating to recognize that, you know, they had no way to demonstrate alignment. Uh, to privacy, right? Like, you know, the, the values were there, the statements are there, we value privacy, um, we, we get people's consent before sharing attributes, and we're like, but your entire infrastructure underneath is tracking and profiling people. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's great that you're up here, but we need to get down here. And we would spend months arguing about those kinds of privacy risks, like what was the actual risk? And so we ended up developing a, a tool. So we actually developed a whole model to identify privacy risk and a whole tool for risk assessment methodology. And uh, the pilots began to use it and you know, immediately the conversation changed. And 
to that, that I think for me generally was the most exciting part of, you know, as a privacy person mm -hmm. to, you know, have them have those conversations and begin to think about different solutions. And the solutions weren't always the one that we as a research institution were most interested in, but they were reasonable solutions mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. sort of the business needs and, and pressures of the organization. Were they to steal some of Candace's thunder scalable? <laughs> That was what they were working towards, but that, that's one of the issues that we found, that when you break the protocol, right, mm -hmm. then it's not scalable. And so we have to go back now and fix, you know, fix, you know, and improve those standards so that they can be scalable. So, so we often say security needs to be architected into solutions. I think you're saying privacy considerations need to be architected absolutely. into solutions as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question before you? Um, no. How's, how's that? How's that? How's, I mean, no. Go ahead. How, no. Okay. No. How's your? How's what you're doing going to interact with the the NTIA's request for comments and the and the uh, what's what I see is coming the development of some sort of federal privacy framework standard at a more uh, august strategic level <laughs> uh, that may lead to legislation. Uh, what's the interaction, if any? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, so that's correct. NTIA has an RFC out on this. You know, they're looking at this sort of domestic policy approach. Uh, and NIST, um, we have a sort of parallel but separate effort to develop a voluntary privacy framework. So if you, um, you know, we. I want to be clear, we have no preconceived ideas, but if you think we're at least following the process of how we convened and developed the cybersecurity framework, um, but and in, in hoping for that kind of success in terms of developing a tool or a guide that help, can help organizations better manage privacy. We got some numbers yesterday that said people are actually using the framework. I mean, the person who told me was sort of surprised, but the framework counts as a success. Do we you think do. you can do the same thing? In, uh, it will, That's a we'll, we'll let you know in a year. Okay. <laughs> so, Candace, when you listen to all this, one of the things that struck me as we were doing the research for this report is that the technology has changed so much, and it's only been 20 years, mm -hmm. but the, the whole panoply of back office operations, the network connections that are sort of invisible to the user have mm -hmm. changed how we could do authentication. And, I don't know what you think the next steps might be in this or the direction we should take. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting to contemplate is the fact that when the social security number was created as an identifier, was never intended to be what we use it for today. Was it 1936, I think the report said? When you went to borrow money or visit the doctor or do whatever you were gonna do, you, sh you showed up and stood in front of that person. So, so you had your social security number and you gave it to them and they looked at you and said, yeah, I know you, Bob, you've lived in town for like 47 years, right? So, so there, was a, there was almost always a physical presence that was a second level or two factor authentication variable in that transaction. As we've progressed into the digital world, like there's no other, there's no physical representation of you that that person on the other end of the wire can use to go like, yeah, that's Candace. I mean, you know, I can, I can see on her, her, uh, social, her social security number plus her driver's license or her passport. I mean, you know, there's that, that anonymity to a certain extent that the internet brings into this discussion. And I, I think that's one of the challenges, right, is we've lost that physical presence in the authentication part of the process. So security number now can be any face with my number or your number or anyone's number and the person on the other end of the wire wouldn't know it. So as we contemplate kind of where we go next, we've got to look at technologies that, that one, as the technology world evolves, it can evolve with it. And that's what I meant by kind of scalability and extensibility. because. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, we can ponder what technology may be available in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and we might get it right. I'd assert, you know, we've pondered that in the past and we got it partially right. Um, you know, who would have thought the smartphone was gonna be what it is 25 years ago, right? We knew we would have smartphones. We just didn't know they'd basically be our laptop. Um, and that's kind of what they've become. So as we think about the technology of the future, I think it's very difficult for us to understand the extent to which that technology will evolve. 
And so that's why I feel like the extensibility of whatever program or platform we create for that backend infrastructure has to be flexible enough that it can evolve with technology mm -hmm. versus being a forklift upgrade when we determine that the current system is no longer functional and we have to make a change. I would think the social security number will remain sort of the cornerstone of identity, but I'm not sure all on ICI to that. that. What I've been thinking about is we're moving towards a world where everyone will be connected at the hip to their mobile device and that will become using some technology we may not know, whether it's biometrics, something else, the mobile device will become the credential of choice. So in that environment, Paul, why don't you start and talk about what a mobile environment means? Maybe Naomi can then talk about privacy. What do we think about? We have to link it in some way to, to this trusted credential. Well, I, 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 I agree with you that, that eventually it's going to probably be something you carry with you. Uh, and uh, whether it's cards or something embedded in your phone or something uh, of that nature, it, that, that's the most likely uh, way to go s instead of something static. Uh, so, so there are kind of conceptually uh, two problems or two challenges that we're going to have to get to to that. The first is issuance, right, or, uh, or, or authentication at the front end. How do you get that credential in the first instance um, such that it is indelibly linked to the true Jim Lewis whoever the true Jim Lewis is. And, and this Jim Lewis, not the, you know, you have the unfortunate you know, characteristic of having many doppelganger, named doppelgangers out there, um, even if you use the A, right? Uh, so so linking, linking that to you, the, the, the person with this set of permissions, this set of connections, and this set of authorizations, as opposed to the, the criminal Jim Lewis down the street who, who, who should be arrested on site. So how, issuance is the first one. And then uh, the second is whether or not the, that the mobility is going to be tied exclusively, uh, I mean, the authentication is going to be tied exclusively to the mobile component that you're carrying with you. That is, it authenticates essentially on chip, on device, or linked back to a large scale database. As far as I can see, there's no alternative architecture between those two. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe I'm waiting for somebody to say blockchain and distribute it, and, and that is a possibility that so far in the future it's not content, contemplatable now. If it's tied to the device itself, then the then the security challenge becomes the security of the device. How many people have lost their phone, right? If you lose, if if the device is your authenticator and you lose the phone, you lose yeah. your identity. Uh, it may not be usable by somebody else, but then you have to go get a replacement. On the other hand, if we go back to the, we go to a centralized authenticator that uh, assumes kind of mobile connections and stuff like that, then there's two questions, right? The first is how many people have been in a place where their device doesn't have internet service, right? Uh, we'd, we'd really have to guarantee that. But the other one is then we get back to the who's the centralized authenticator question, which is kind of this fundamental issue about government or, or a commercial person or, or, I mean, maybe there's some trusted third party, you know, NGO-ish type group out there that we could all love like NIST that isn't really, <laughs> that's government but isn't political. Uh, so that, 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 the architecture of the, of the mobile problem is first identifying you and then securing it. We, we did try at one point, we, uh, I was in one of the early authentication efforts, and we tried NIST. They wisely declined. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried the Federal Reserve. They also declined. And we tried the post office and thought, this is a great business model for you guys. You can be the credential issuers. And they also declined, which I think was probably a mistake, because it would have given them a replacement for paper mail. But finding that trusted third party turns out to be hard. Uh, I want to ask Naomi about that. But before, I want to get Candace to say, what she thinks about your remarks on architecture. I know this is a little wonky, but do you think those are the two architectures we have? Basically, it's, it's like a credential, you carry it on your phone, or it's a network thing where the phone connects back to some central database. Well, so, so I'm actually gonna throw another kink in there. 
uh -huh. um, which is going to probably cause Naomi in the, the privacy position to cringe. Um, I'm, I'm literally in a, I think it was in a, um, a cab in Silicon Valley a couple weeks ago. That's and, amazing you found a cab in Silicon Valley. And I'm talking, it might have been an Uber driver, I don't know. So I'm talking to this person, they were talking about this company, and, and I'm, I don't know the name of the company, so I can't give you that name, that um, is essentially exploring the idea of implanted chips where uh, part of your, your credentials, whether that's your credit card number, your social security number, your whatever, can be carried on this chip. And to work for this company, you actually have to agree to have a chip implanted, which you know made me cringe. In your body? Well. In your body. Okay. Yeah. So I had kind of a, vis a visceral <laughs> reaction to this discussion myself. Um, also, but, if you get lost and end up in the pound, they can find you. Yeah, they can find you, exactly. <laughs> your spouse, your children can have you scanned. Um, so, so my point being, this is an illustrative example of how, for us, it can be almost impossible to comp contemplate what could be at some point in the future. Because again, like, you know, that was great sci-fi a few years ago, but we would have all went, oh, seriously, nobody's going to do that. Obviously, somebody's doing it because they're employed by this company and they're getting chipped. And so maybe it becomes an implanted chip that becomes the authentication versus the phone. And I'm not advocating that. Please do not uh, interpret that as advocation. <laughs> it is simply a, a provocative way of illustrating that it can be difficult to contemplate what technology may be available and what technology uh, citizens may tolerate in order to gain control back of their identity and privacy. And, and I think the phone is an option I think the challenge is we still have plenty of places that don't have internet connectivity. So a central authority that it has to check with every time becomes problematic. As well as the fact that as soon as your phone becomes your identifier, every thief in the world is gonna be targeting your phone, right? I mean, you think your latest Apple phone now is a target? Wait till it becomes your primary form of identity and authentication. It will become a much more attractive target. And so I, I think it's a possibility. I just think that there is not a perfect solution. We're not going to find a perfect solution. What we have to find is a solution that provides enough security that it at least gets us a little further than we are right now. And, and, and then let's evolve it over time. Let's not make it static. Right. Let's make it dynamic. In the, in the, before Paul talks, and then I want to get Naomi's reaction to being chipped. Um, <laughs> In the wild up. startup department, one of the companies we came across, it turns out everyone's brainwave is unique. Yeah. And there's a way with you know, your earplug on your phone or something to detect your brainwaves and it proves that you are you. So Heartbeat also. It wow. just, it, the range of biometric data that's unique turns out to be much greater than we thought, but the means for obtaining it might be physically obtrusive. <laughs> but we'll, Paul, did you want to say something? Well, oh, I, I just wanted, with respect to the chip idea, it reminded me of the, I believe true, but perhaps apocryphal story about when President Reagan was first considering um, a proposal for a national identification uh, number that everybody would get that would be a kind of mm -hmm. quasi social security number. And uh, it was really gaining a lot of momentum in, in the administration until one of his advisors and they say it was the chief of staff, James Baker, but again, this may be apocalypse. And Mr. President, we've got a perfect solution. Right? We'll give everybody uh, a unique number, and they'll carry it with them. What we'll do is we'll tattoo it on their forearm. Right? And that was, that was the end of, of the uh, identification number debate. Uh, in the, and the chip just kind of reminded me of we're, that. We're going we're gonna to edit that part out of the, uh, the online tape. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a true story. Yeah, and to the audience on the people who are watching this online, just when Paul talks, just, you know. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, Naomi, when you hear about being chipped, what do you think? What's NIST doing on sort of the biometric front and the new technologies? You, you, how do you develop Build standards? Build privacy in. <laughs> how do you develop standards for something that doesn't exist yet? Um, well, I'd like to make a couple points first. So, um, just to clarify some things about where you know what NIST is doing. So, one of the things that we have done um, is that we have broken apart identity identification from authentication, and that's hmm. very important. Um, and so, we have a, we updated our digital identity guidelines in 2016. It's special public. 863-3 uh, and there we 
and that's what we did. Instead of saying, you know, there's just this monolith between identity proofing, right, like the process of figuring out who you are, uh, and authentication, which is those assertions that say, I'm the same person that you saw before. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, can be completely synonymous, right? It could be, as long as you're, you know, Daffy Duck 123 coming back, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and so, the, so it, even in that, there are some privacy enhancing protections by breaking those two pieces apart. Um, and so doing that then allows you to have lots of different types of authenticators. And, uh, and so you can, and, and I, I would, you know, I just want to echo what Candace was saying. There's no perfect solution, in fact, which is why we're going for diversity. Um, and, you know, not only from, you know, consumer preference, right? People have uh, different demographics, have different, you know, some people are not comfortable with bones, they're not using them, other people are doing other things. So, you know, both from a consumer preference of, of, of choice and convenience, but also from this kind of, you know, traditional arms race, right? If we, you know, invest in one solution, then that's what everybody's going to try to break. But mm -hmm. build, ter build for diversity and expect to change constantly. And that yeah. probably also will make it easier to evolve with technology if we have a diverse Correct. set of solutions, I would think. Correct. So I think it was Candace who said we need to create a marketplace of choice. Was that you? No, I think that, that was Oh, it was Naomi. Yeah, oh, well, you got the blame then. Um, <laughs> how do you create a marketplace of choice? What are the choices you want to offer people? I mean, we, the uh, Americans tend to say market is the answer to every problem, and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So how do you create this marketplace? Um, well, that was one of the goals of the pilots, mm. um, was to sort of seed that. And then, you know, in fact, there are um, no, new providers out there um, that have, you know, gotten off the ground um, through mm -hmm. those pilots and have been, you know, issuing credentials and doing authentication. Um, you know, uh, you can certainly see that Fido has a whole, you know, is, is working on this, uh, uh, you know, authentication, right? That's very, uh, that's, you know, you can match up with an identity proofing. You can uh, use it in a variety of ways. Um, so, so there is a developing, you know, ecosystem of, of solutions out there. So we have um, different companies doing, you know, things like selfies, right, with selfie authentication, right? Um, so, so there is the idea is that you can uh, scan your driver's license. There will be a, you know, a, a, a reach back to the DMV to, you know, demonstrate that it's a genuine driver's license, and then take a live selfie and match that against the driver's license and use that uh, to build a, a, an identity um, and then be able to um, authenticate into other solutions. So, so there's like, there's, there's many, and as you said, there's a whole field going on, um, I don't know, some people call it behavioral transactions, um, some people call it biometrics, but uh, to, you know, try to reduce some of the friction uh, and you know, really see whether that is you know authenticate whether that's person from their gait or their heartbeat or whatever. And again, I don't know that anyone is wrong, but as you say, we have to sort of recognize where the privacy risks are mm -hmm. and work to mitigate them. So uh, I, I don't think that it's inconceivable that we can um, ach achieve that, but we do have to focus on that. So one of the things that Candace did say, as opposed to Naomi, was scalability and extensibility. And when I think about that, some of the challenges we've had in the past have involved what you would call um, cross-domain authentication. So I, I have, and you probably have, a number of very secure credentials, like for m relatively secure for my bank or my credit union. But it only works with that one entity. And when you go to use it across the border, you all probably have Amazon accounts, but it's very difficult to use that to log into something else. What do we do about cross-domain authentication? I mean, that's been one of, another one of the stumbling blocks along with privacy is that you can have a great credential, but if nobody trusts the issuer enough to accept it, it only, it's a one-time event. How do you break that? It goes back to your Kellogg's example where they only trust themselves. They don't trust any third parties. And the whole idea of federated ID has been around for a long time, but as we know, since we don't have it, 
um, it's hard. It's hard to get companies to trust other companies. It's hard to get companies to trust the government and vice versa. It's hard to get consumers to trust either. And, and yet they currently apparently trust some of the social media sites to be their form of authentication, which is an interesting position to take given I have, recent. I would have said weird, but. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to be. Being polite, yeah. Yes. Okay, um, an interesting position given recent developments, obviously. And so I think. I think the only way we're going to get to that kind of a solution, Jim, is there's going to have to be some acceptance that these constituents need to work together to find a joint solution where, where maybe, and, and part of what I did like about what you guys were proposing, where the government becomes kind of the foundational element of trust, much like they are with the financial institutions, right? They, they print the money. We all believe every day when, when we go to use money that it's real and it has value, and we, we believe that because... For some reason, we believe that the government can print money and that it's worth something. That's the only reason that dollar bill, somebody takes it from you and trade for a good. And so, you know, looking to the government to be some form of, of a basis of trust, so to speak, in an identity program, and then maybe leveraging private industry to be the conduit through which we deliver the credential. You know, the, the secondary credential. I, I actually think the proxy idea was a very interesting idea, the proxy number. Um, and by that, now you have two elements in the process. So I'm not trusting the government inherently because there's private industry involved as well. I'm not trusting that private industry is going to have my best interest at part because we all know that the almighty dollar is really what they're after and we become an element in the process of getting one. So we have a check and balance. Government is maybe a root of trust, industry as a delivery uh, vehicle for the credential, and so, you know, it's, I think that can be a potential solution that people could buy into. But it's going to take the, the two groups working closely together to create a program um, that's viable, both from a technology perspective as well as from a consumption perspective. Paul or Naomi, do you want to contribute to that? I'll just point out that this morning, before the event, I was reading the South China Morning Post. And to log in, they offered me the option of giving them my Facebook password. I just thought, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Anyhow, Paul. So that's a, it's an interesting concept to bring up the idea of money and why it is a trusted repository for uh, probably the only thing that we actually all trust the government about. Uh, it, it completely, except for the few people who are going into Bitcoin. Going over, <laughs> over to blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, but I, I think that. that you're on to something, which is the real reason we trust cash, uh, is because the government works very hard to be the monopolistic uh, author of cash. Right? They, I mean, anti-counterfeiting laws are strong. We have a, an entire agency that works to 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 work on them, and you know, by and large, they do a mm -hmm. you know. 90%. It's one of the grand successes in government is that you know, there isn't a proliferation of counterfeit money. Uh, it, when it becomes problematic, they, they redesign it. Uh, which does suggest that um, the role of the government as the ur source of identity will not just turn on the fact that it's the issuer of it, but that, it, that, it, that, as, a monopoly, that as the ur source, it's the monopoly and that it actually invests lots of resources in prosecuting you know, the creation of fake identities in some way. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how that works out systematically, you know, what, what, what agencies you create to do that and how you work with that, but uh, it does, I, I, I have long thought that ultimately it's all gonna have to track back to the government whether we like it or not. And uh, if we're gonna have a, a truly secure, authenticated form of identity, uh, uh, but that's about as far as my thinking has taken me on that. I'm sticking with diversity. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, it's very natural to, you know, want a core solution. We're going to nail down identity, and I just don't believe that, right? It's just a, a risk spectrum. And if we could accept that, <laughs> And then, you know, we might actually get to better solutions, right? Instead of sort of looking for this holy grail of identity. 
Um, but, and, and, and then we actually might embrace diversity because we would recognize that um, it's inev inevitable that in some way identity is going to get compromised, whether somebody gets in ahead of you with um, you know, false information or the databases get compromised. But you know, when one database gets compromised, you can go to another identity provider and just recreate your identity in terms of you know, mm -hmm. you're still you, you just need a credential demonstrating that and you need that other credential revoked. Right. And so you can just, you know, quickly get that done and get back on into access to your systems. I mean, the one encouraging thing I would say is when I was reading an article about the um, the, the recent Facebook breach is, you know, somebody, the, the journalist or reporter finally mentioned that, hey, you know, if you've done, um, you know, two factor authentication, which you can do on your Facebook account, you probably wouldn't have that much of a problem, right? It wouldn't have mattered that much that your password was breached. And I was like, I was like, I'm taking that as a breakthrough because two years ago, I don't think anybody would even have mentioned that. The reporter would never even have mentioned that. So, so just go ahead, Candace. I'm when, sorry. when you use the term diversity, just I, I just want to clarify what I think you mean. I'm hearing you say diversity in terms of who becomes the trusted source of the credential versus mm -hmm diversity in the approach to creating, aka the, uh, the authentication medium itself? Um, in terms of the protocols, yes yeah. to the first. Okay. Diversity in a range of um, providers, identity so proofers, yeah. authenticators, credential um, providers. Um, but you know, this is the reason that 863, you know, we recognize inherently in there that this is a risk management process, um, but nonetheless do try to give some guidance about, you know, good identity proofing methodology. Okay, can, can I Thank ask you for a follow-up too? Because does that, I, 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 I have wanted to ask, does that include diversity as to the, to the, uh, the creation of the initial identity? Right, at, 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 you know, the initial identity for Jim Lewis was created on the date of his birth by the issuance of a birth certificate um, that gave him a name. I mean, and there's lots of other factors that, that tie to that. But do, do you imagine a diversity where instead of going to the government to, uh, to give me an identity, I can go to uh, Facebook or, 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 uh, or M McAfee and say, uh, and they can give me instead of Paul Rosenzweig, uh, you know, PR one two seven three nine six eight J, and that would be an identity as well as an authentic, uh, without being linked back to the Paul Rosenzweig who was born in New York City far too long ago. Um, sure, because it depends on your use case. It depends on what you're trying to access. So in some cases, you do need. Um, a tie back to those original sort of breeder documents of, of you know, I, of, um, uh, you know, birth certificates, but you know, some people don't have birth certificates. And, um, and so this is where I get to, this is sort of a, a risk management process because, you know, some people have these documents, others don't. You have to cobble together other types of information to demonstrate um, their identity and we can still do that, and different organizations can be part of that process. So, um, when we did the research, and this has been true for a while, the breeder doc there's two breeder documents that are the basis of most people's identity in the U.S. The first is the birth certificate, which is a still a somewhat decentralized system, and the second is the social security number. And those are the two things that are the foundation of your assertion that you are who you are. Right? So one of the things that came up, I meant to say, and I forgot that on the chairman's bio, it says he's a fiscal hawk. And there's a benefit to that because what is the role of the Social Security Administration in this? Do we give them a new task? They have a day job. Um, but their, by default, their number has turned out to be one of the core documents. So what do you want to do with the SSA? Go ahead. Can I just push back on the SSN for a second. Sure. So uh, I feel like sometimes there's a confusion between what an identifier is and identification. 
So the SSN is a great identifier, which means that it's really good at linking mm -hmm. documents, right? And linking records, basically. It's good at linking records. Um, and so it's those records and that information in there which can help to prove your identity, but it's not the social security number on its own that's a identification document. And so, um, so you know, I think that's where some of the issues come in and I, you know, probably where the path came in of using it as a representation of who you say you are. Um, but really, it's a very good, um, as has proven, <laughs> a very good identifier for linking records. And at, at the end of the day, you know, something has to link records. And so it's concerning to say, you know, I would worry that we're, you know, sort of kicking the can down the road by saying, oh, we're going to, you know, replace the SSN or something like that. I do think, you know, there's certainly value in making sure that, you know, you're not just sort of out of um, laziness, you know, relying on it to link records that don't need to be linked. But there are absolutely use cases where records need to be linked across organizations. and. Uh, and certainly in the government that has been part of the role of the social security number. So I do just want to sort of put that out there. But one of the things that was interesting about the report, I thought, in your proposal in terms of a solution, was that they, they actually proposed retaining the social security number as that identifying link, but having, and, and again, I'm going to use this term loosely, a second factor of authentication, which was Correct. a smart card with a secondary number. Yep. Part of the challenge right now is when your social security number gets stolen, you can't get a new one very easily. Like, it's your identifier for life, and if it gets compromised, you're fighting constantly to regain that identity. All you have to do is talk to somebody whose identity has been stolen, and, and just the trauma they go through trying to, to reclaim their life. And so I think that secondary element that can be tied to the identifier, is that what you called it? Identifier, yes. yeah. yeah. Could be a way of mitigating a kind of risk for individuals as well as the impact of a stolen social security number for the individual. And again, not a silver bullet, but could be an, in, could be an interesting and viable option for addressing this challenge, at least, like I said earlier, for the short term. Well, and I absolutely agree in that sense that, but we shouldn't mix up the social security number as an identifier for linking records with the credential identifier, which actually can be, uh, is, the Canadians have finally named a EMBA and a meaningless but unique uh, number. <laughs> and so you can attach that to the, the digital credential, mm -hmm. right? And so if that credential gets compromised, you revoke that, and you issue a new one, a new one yes. you have a new number, um, and that just sits on top of your, your social security number identifier, which is really the thing that's just linking records that are necessary. Yeah, and the precedent we looked at was your credit card, which is when you lose your credit card, they don't give you a whole new identity, they just give right. you a new credit card number. Correct. So you still have your account, it's still linked That's to everything. Right. Paul, you were gonna I, I like that M button, I hadn't heard that before. <laughs> Meaningless but unique number, that's the credit card. Um, the, the only twist to this, or the challenge that I wanna uh, pose, is I agree completely with the distinction between identifiers and identities. But when you make that distinction and you won't let identifiers be um, uh, proxies for identity, then you still have the question of what it is that, that establishes an identity. And if you are unwilling to use um, a, an identifier, some, some number or some, or some other factor, and if you're unwilling to use an authenticator, be it for the very good and sufficient reason that we've, we've learned that lesson well, then you're reduced to, to doing identity by some characteristic of the individual that is immutable, right? Indefeasible, that is unstealable, and unchangeable, uh, and uh, it, uh, there was one other, there's uh, one other I, uh, immutable, uh, unique, and, and, un, and undefeasible, unstealable or unreproducible, right? And we don't have one of those yet, right? I mean, metric. the fingerprints are, are kind of immutable, right? But they're not unstealable, right? Uh, they and they are and you know, so and they are unique, or we think they're unique. So so we, we haven't got if you if you can't use an identifier as an as as a proxy for identity, 
then in some sense you're saying that there is no way for Jim Lewis to prove that he is Jim Lewis. And, and you know, in some way that is, that can't be uh, falsified or, 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 or uh, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, used to his disadvantage. You, you notice that they all dodged my question about what the SSA should be doing, Social Security Administration would be doing. Giving out money. So let me, let me broaden it a little bit. So I'll take a shot at that. Okay, well, let me broaden it and then you can okay. take a shot. Which is, what do you want the role of the federal government to be in the, okay. the identity management system? Yes. And that was where I was going to go. So okay. the Social Good. Security Administration, I'm sure, gets its mission from somewhere further up the chain, mm -hmm. right? And as we contemplate you know, the, the government's role, um, in, in fact, you know, we were talking about this earlier with some of the folks that, that are on my team, like, this probably requires some level of executive order that says this is a priority that um, you know, our mm. nation will be more sound if we can solve this problem and if we contemplate some of the work that we've done with you in the past, right, around the economic impact of, of Cy uh, cyber crime and you know, what was the last report? Four to four to six hundred million oh, is yes. the global impact Conservative. conservatively yeah. global impact of cyber crime. I think the U.S. was one seventy five around there, yeah. one seventy, mm -hmm. one hundred seventy million dollar impact. Billion or billion? Excuse mm -hmm. me. That cyber crime has on the GDP of the U.S. Like that's a problem we should all be worried about. And so I think it has to come from an executive level mm -hmm. that if we can through uh, increasing the security of individual identities in this country, reduce the amount of profit cyber criminals can gain from their craft, that's goodness. And I think our, our, you know, the executive branch should take a look at giving some instruction to the organizations below and helping to either redefine their mission or create a new organization who has that mission. But I think it has to come from the highest level. Probably right. Naomi, I know this isn't something NIST would normally touch, but when you think about this, how would you, how would you organize this? What do you see? You're a part of the federal government. You're playing a role. It's a crucial role. What else do we need to be doing? And building perhaps off Candace's remarks that you need some central direction here from the executive branch. Um, so there was an executive order, and I I'm terrible at remembering numbers, Jordan. I don't know if you remember the number, but it's um, securing consumer financial transactions. Um, and so embody, embedded in there was a, fu a funny section, section three, that I remember. Um, you know, working on, you know, directing agencies to uh, have more robust um, identity proofing and, and authentication mm -hmm. and, and moving towards multi-factor authentication. So, um, you know, it, I, think, I think the issue is that it's just not happening as fast as, of course, we would all like and we need. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing. I've been in this space for, since I guess 2001, <laughs> and we still have a lot of the same conversations. Um, but, um, it's Groundhog you know, Day. <laughs> I just made my son watch that so he would understand <laughs> the, the phrase. Um, uh, but I do see progress. It's just, it's just very, you know, this, this trust infrastructure is just incredibly hard to build. And so that is, you know, one reason why we are really focusing on standards right now to see if, you know, that can give it the next boost forward. Well, I, I'm going to throw you another bone here. I think that's part of the reason people got so excited about blockchain. Because it, it sort of, you know, people hoped that it was that panacea of yeah, trust. And, and it's simply not. Mm -hmm. it, it is a good technology that has vulnerabilities just like any other technology we have, yeah. right? Um, but, I, but I think that's why people got so excited about it. It's like, oh, wow, maybe this can solve this problem. Oh, yeah. wow, like it can solve part of the problem but it still has some of the same challenges that a lot of the other solutions we've looked at in the past have had. And, and so, you know, it's, we keep hoping we got there and then we, you know, pop the hood and we go like, oh, yeah, it's got some of the same challenges, right? So, so Jimmy, your next panel has to be blockchain artificial intelligence. <laughs> you, you were talking about that before, that we, someone needs to say that blockchain implementations 
will work when they're directed by artificial intelligence powered by quantum computing. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So can I answer your yes. question? I think, I, think, I think that you're exactly right. The first and best and highest value for government is uh, standard setting so that everybody kind of can start playing on the same field, much like the NIST framework, which was, as you said, a really great you know, non-mandatory kind of uh, exemplar of best practices that people can use or, or not. You know. um, I think that the second thing that is, it might lie ahead of that is some form of uh, methodolo methodological validation. You know, not just here's the standards, but some form of certification that company X seems to be doing it right. That runs some risks for the government in terms of, of uh, you know, picking winners and losers in, in the commercial marketplace. But we do that all the time. We have you know, safety regimes and, and, uh, and other regulatory regimes that give pass-fail grades to commercial enterprises in a, in a host of regulatory systems. And, and, and this is one where that would be optimistic because other, uh, uh, a useful value, because otherwise, if, I, if we've got a diverse system, I, as a consumer, am not really qualified to choose between company A, company B, mm -hmm. company C, and company D. But if company A and B have you know, the NIST seal of, of approval, or, or somebody other than NIST, because NIST probably won't want the job, but that'll, that'll be useful. So, so certification will be a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the third thing that was, is, is the most ambitious is some form of audit um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that actually you know, does a recertification on a periodic basis and withdraws that. And, then, and if the government passed those three, uh, did those three things, you know, that would be really robust. Um, we're getting to the point where you get to ask questions. Uh, there's no question too wonky for this group, so please feel free. Um, I'm going to ask a question, though, to start things off. What's your favorite credential, personally? What's the one that you like the best? Your driver's license, your passport, your Facebook? What do you have? YubiKey. Yeah? Two-factor authentication. I carry it with me all the time. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Naomi? <laughs> um, I'm still pretty partial to like uh, the, um, you know, the authenticators that, you know, give you uh, revolving numbers. So mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to use. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, that's YubiKey. So I have Candace, one too. What do you use? So, I mean, just for convenience, if, if I'm not, you know, putting in a password and somebody just wants to see my face and look at something and know it's me, I'd go with passport. For digital transactions, I want two-factor authentication. I want some sort of, um, I log in, it sends an email to my phone or a text to my mm -hmm. phone uh, or my laptop, wherever I'm going to pick that up, and then I pull a number and I plug that in so that... Um, at least I have to have that other device in my possession in order to be able to to validate that who I said I was is who I am. Um, that, that's why I use the key, because yeah. I carry my house keys all the time. Yeah. I don't carry my phone all the time. I carry uh, my phone almost all the time. Well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. You see different choices for different people. <laughs> <laughs> Although I wouldn't want my phone to be the only way I could I, I authenticate because right. you know it is one of those devices that's small enough that gets mis mis misplaced occasionally, and I have to ask my husband to call it so that I can find it in the house somewhere, right? Although I hate saying it, but in some ways it's uh, it might be you know I, it might be generational because. I think the younger you are, the more likely it is that you will always have your phone with you. Oh, thank you, Jim. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so, one of the dynamics that will change how we think about authentication will be the increasing reliance on mobile technologies. I think, and that's been something that at least I didn't think about when the dawn of the internet but occurred. It could be the Apple Watch. I mean, it could yeah. be an Apple Watch. Right. You know, there's so many uh, form factors uh, through which we can get a digital signal now mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the phone just happens to be the one that's most pervasive at this point. Right. But over time, I think that form factor will evolve and it could look very different. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, just this is wonky, but it's a side, 
Do you think that the computing power will be enough to support a stronger encryption on, on that mobile device, on like your did, Apple phone? Did any of us think that the computing power on a watch would be strong enough we get email? Yeah. I mean, no. like, like I, I mean, going back to your previous comment, this will completely invalidate it. Um, you know, m the first laptop I packed around was an old compact that had an orange and black monitor and was larger than my current carry-on bag, <laughs> right? Um, and probably had, you know, a, a sliver of the computing capability of the smartphone that I have in my pocket today. So, yeah, I, I think we'll get to that point, absolutely. Did we have any questions? Uh, oh, good. Lots, good. We'll go, we'll go across the room there, so we'll start with you, sir. And I think if you could wait for the microphone. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Dan Vasquez, CEO of IntelliWings. Uh, my question is, how can industry uh, participate better in supporting this kind of initiative? Uh, my partner company, Fornetics, has invented a new encryption key management system called Key Orchestration. And it's capable of handling hundreds of millions of keys, rekeying on the fly. Uh, it's uh, backwards and forwards compatible with all different kinds of encryption systems. Uh, solutions like this are, are out there already. How can we get that into the hands of Social Security or other folks that need that kind of system? Thank you. Anyone? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think it goes back to the discussion around as we contemplate a solution to this particular challenge, you know, I think your diversity, your diversity comment actually plays to this very well. Create an environment where in new technologies that could make the secure ID better um, should be easily adoptable and interjected into the overall program. So to build on Naomi's point about diversity and, and on Candace's remark, what we did find is that people want more than one credential if they have a, if they have a chance. That there's core credentials, we could discuss what they are, that usually are government issued mm -hmm. that everyone trusts, but they're not, you're not going to be using your passport for your day-to-day -day transactions. So they want multiple credentials, and being able to manage them would be good. Can you hold up your hand again, and we'll go down the, the row here. Um, we'll go on here. Thank you. I'll wait for the mic, and please identify yourself. I'm David Tenadio. I run a communications and marketing consultancy. I have, I guess, what you would call an edge case as far as these things go. Um, we have a project that we do for the Consumer Technology Association every year that requires that we do research on ride sharing and short-term rentals and other things in about 60 countries. Mm -hmm. So for that, we need linguists in a lot of these countries. And when they're in the United States, they're easy to pay by ACH. But when they're outside of the United States, they're not. So that means that we end up having to wire them potentially or to use PayPal potentially. And we actually got to a rather comic point in the last several weeks where despite having social security numbers, home addresses, dates of birth, business accounts, credit card numbers, and all the relevant authorities, we could not convince PayPal to settle transactions. So despite having all of the trusted credentials that you could possibly have, we were unable to complete the business of a legitimate United States corporation. So I was in the position of having conversations with people, ironically, in India, but in any event, you know, having to say, look, we're United States business, we're instructing you to complete the transaction, American Express is instructing you to complete the transaction, and the recipient, you know, in Germany is instructing you to complete the transaction, and even using your invoicing system to invoice us, so what is the problem here? Obviously, if you're a very large corporation and you can create your own system of, of authentication or you can always afford wire transfer fees or things like that, that's not a problem. But that should, I think, illustrate the enormity of the problem. If you're, I mean, you could use blockchain to steal somebody's social security number like that, but if you're a legitimate business, to pay somebody for legitimate work under a contract that's valid, <laughs> you don't actually have the means to do that anymore because nobody trusts your bank account number plus your social security number plus your two-factor authentication system. What do you do about that? I mean, how do, you, how do you coordinate a federal response when that's the situation that businesses are actually confronting? Well, I think that that's one of the challenges potentially of a diverse solution because if PayPal says, well, I don't trust your credential, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? So if PayPal doesn't trust your credentials, in a very diverse environment, you can go, okay, fine, PayPal, don't trust my credentials. I'm going to take my business somewhere else. And I'm going to get a set of credentials from this other business where 
they'll vet those credentials, they'll vet my transaction request, and they'll make a decision about whether or not to move forward. Um, so I, I think that's the plus of a diverse environment. The negative is that now it becomes up to the companies solely to determine whether or not those credentials are acceptable. And you know, just like people are concerned about putting too much power in the hands of government, I think we should be equally concerned about putting too much uh, power in the hands of private industry. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't have the perfect answer for you. I think, you know, I'd go back to the diversity question in terms of we have to create an environment where when you hit that roadblock with that company, there is a place for you to turn, whether that place is the government or another company. So j just to respond, I, I live half the year in Costa Rica. I have the exact same problem when I try and use PayPal from Costa Rica because they geo they geolocate me in Costa Rica, and and that's you know uh, I'm an American from Costa Rica. They haven't figured that out yet. I actually wound up calling a friend who's a senior vice president there, and he unlocked the account for me, which isn't a solution that would work for you. Uh, but one of the things. But one of the things that your question does suggest, which is a, a, a problem that we really haven't discussed here, is that a solution that works for America is not a globalized solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you take all of the challenges we've been having here about centralized versus diversified and, and, and our inability to resolve that on an American scale where by and large, the government is trustable, and by and large, you know, uh, everybody's on the same page culturally, and you try and propagate that into a world of, you know, countries ranging from New Zealand to China to Saudi Arabia to Gabon, and and I, I think honestly, that's a problem that's not going to be solved in our lifetime. Uh, I, I, at least not in mine, and 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 because of that, hey, um, you aren't you aren't going anywhere soon, are you? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I got a birthday this month, so no, I got a I got 30 years, but I I think it's not going to happen, uh, and and so I I think that there's two things are going to happen. There's going to be a commercial market for reconciling that, where where there's going to be a diversity, and there'll be people who do that, and then the other one is you're just going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Tough We're, beans. We're, and I, I don't know if NIST is tracking this, but a lot of countries are experimenting with uh, different models. And you know, some of them are easy. You're, you're Estonia, there's only like 120 people in the country. And so you just give them all a number, right? Yeah. But you've got big, you've got India, for example, oh God, yeah. Adahar, a billion credentials, holy cow. And they just ran into privacy problems. Yeah, they got yeah. whacked. The Brits are trying a uh, federated Verify. system that has mixed uh, take up by people, so we're in a period of a, we're not the only country trying to solve this, and we'll see who does better. I think we're actually behind, though. We're actually behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and maybe maybe that's a good thing, because maybe it gives us the opportunity to learn mm -hmm. from what other companies are experimenting with, mm -hmm. and and look at the technological approaches, the cultural implications of those approaches, mm -hmm. and learn from that as we define what we think we need to do in this country. Right? How, how it could be an opportunity. At, how much do you look at the other? Yeah. Uh, constantly, we have um, lots of engagement with, um, directly and through the standard space. Um, this is, in fact, one of the reasons that we um, you know, started some of the work in the standard space because we were working with our counterparts um, on this. Um, you know, there are variety, you know, so, so we're getting both at sort of the framework and the identity proofing level and standards, but we're also working in a, there's a mobile driver's license mm -hmm. standard, um, a technical standard, mm -hmm. working through ISO, um, and, you know, those are some of the pieces that will hopefully help to solve these some of these problems. And I think, you know, picking up on your point earlier, you know, you can start with the standards, then you have to get to that certification piece, right? Because that's where the trust um, will come in, right? And so that there can be some accountability. Okay, okay, I just, I'll just have one thought, which is, yeah, I've, I've actually spent a fair amount of time trying to study when internationalized standards are successful and when they're not. And they tend to be most successful in more technical, less politically 
fraught areas, like the International Marine Organization, right? Yeah, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer to the standard size of a container, so they can pick one, or the allocation of radio frequencies, things like that. This one, because it is fraught, because identity is linked to privacy and is also linked to governmental control, uh, my rump prediction is that the chances of a successful international standard are vanishingly small. China just has no interest in having the same standard as America, period. If I was mean, I would ask uh, the panel, including Naomi, mean, if they have a favorite foreign program. But I'll say for me, it's Norway, because the Norwegians have a credential that goes on your mobile phone. And you can also use it. It's issued by the, their one phone company and their one giant bank. You can use it to buy beer in train stations. And so when I heard that, I was like, this is the credential for me. But don't touch that one. Don't touch if there's, when you look at these programs, I think the British one having problems with a federated approach is instructive. Um, the Indian one is truly ambitious because doing that many people is just. Uh, well, and the biometric implications of that one are yeah. pretty um, interesting. Yeah. And then you do have the split with the Anglo-Saxon countries being less interested in the government issued ID. So it, it, it sort of supports Paul's point is that we, we don't have, now the counter to that is we do have common standards when it comes to passport issuance. And so people more or less agree on here are the things you need to do for a passport. I think that's where the mobile driver's license is essentially trying to go as a technical standard, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, whatever your policies behind it are as a government is sort of irrelevant to how can I trust when this is demon you know, when I when it's shown that it's valid. We had some questions on this side of the room. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name's Tom Gross. I'm retired now, uh, having now living in the United States for two years since I retired from UNESCO in Paris. And there, uh, my bank gave me a card for the chip and pin technique. And you go to restaurants, and you, the waiter brings over a little machine, and you put your card in there, and you give your pin, and you, everything's fine. It was a bit of a uh, culture shock to come to the United States and try to pay for something with my card. And the waiter takes my card away into another room almost, you know, a reason to get up and storm out of a restaurant in Paris. That would be, you know, just culturally, they don't want that. And they claimed at the time that it gave a much lower um, uh, fraud ability for their cards. But in the United States, the fraud level was accepted as part of doing business. Um, and so it kind of comes to my general question here which is any of the techniques that you talk about probably have some percentage failure rate. And so the question really is, what is the level of failure rate that our society can absorb? And then getting to the personal issue, if your identity is incredibly compromised, what sort of level of reconstruction can be done to that? Are these other, you know, these topics of reconstruction, perhaps insurance against uh, identity theft, and such things, they should go along with this discussion of trying to create a perfect identity. Uh, how do you address this issue of risk? Um, well, as I said, the, you know, that is sort of the, the underlying premise of the NIST guidance is that, you know, this is a, a risk management exercise. And so, you know, one of the, the things that we're looking for in terms of uh, digital credentials, right, is that they can be revocable and then, you know, easy to reconstitute so that you can, you know, move on from that, the, you know, any harms that are coming from that, you know, stop that, that identity. I don't think that there's any right answer, right? I, I think your, your reference to cultural uh, norms is, is, is spot on, which is to say that, you know, the sensitivity to privacy, for example, is much higher in Europe, in particular in places like Germany that have had really adverse experiences in their past uh, than it is here uh, in the commercial sphere. And so uh, where any solution is going to have a failure rate. Uh, also, also both not just false positive, but also false negative, right? 
and uh, and and I think Naomi is exactly right that it, that it's a risk management proposition. But the but I think the thing that buried in that is that the risk management decision is going to be uh, idiosyncratic to each system of government or whatever, which actually suggests a different answer, a, a more important answer to your question, which is that more than developing a risk management framework, the more important thing is deciding who inside of a governmental architecture makes the risk management trade-off decisions. And I tend, and, and you know, in the United States, we could pick the executive branch, right, with a top-down risk. We could pick a, a, the judicial branch, where, where litigation is, um, define some reasonable ba risk management choice, or we could choose a legislative branch and let our representatives, like Mr. Johnson, uh, uh, you know, make the choice. In theory, it, would, it should be Mr. Johnson. In today's world, perhaps uh, that's less optimistic, <laughs> uh, given the inability of Congress to make those kinds of decisions systematically. But that's the biggest decision, is who gets to decide risk preference. I also think that, um as citizens, we need to take a little more responsibility for our personal privacy and the control of that personal privacy. So the reason that in Paris they would have a fit if you walked away with a credit card is because they understand that when the credit card leaves your view, there's a good chance it's going to get scammed. Had it happened in Europe, by the way, uh, before chip and pin became prominent. Here, we just accept that you know the person who took that credit card is trustworthy. And inherently, we know that that may or may not be true. And yet, we allow our credit card to you know, go to the back room and assume that the person who took it to the back room is trustworthy. Is it that it's trustworthy or that we know that we, don't, we won't experience adverse consequences? I can't tell you how many times my credit card has been reissued because it, the number has been compromised, either at a, at a retail level by my, by my, by my restaurateur or in, in my case, more recently, you know, at a meta level through a, a hack of Target that had nothing to do with me personally. I think it's a combination. I think, I think you're right. I think the fact that there's no adverse consequences has certainly made that tolerable for us. But I think the inherent, the inherent baseline decision is that humans like to trust. I mean, it's just easier to trust that when they take my credit card, they're not gonna do bad things with it. And, and, and like, think about how much people put out on Facebook. Like all the information we, you know, we put on Facebook as a society that can be used for creating that identity that the person's gonna sell online. And so I think that government has a role in ensuring privacy at some level, whether that's legislative or judicial or whatever that might be. I think companies inherently have some level of responsibility to take privacy into consideration in the architecture of the solutions they bring to market uh, and the processes they use to deliver those solutions to market. But ultimately, I think as citizens, we also have to take some ownership of our privacy and understanding what information we may be putting out in the world that makes it easier for people to steal so, our identity. So then can we agree that one way to drive that is to make failure more painful? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, there's something to be said for the fact that, that, it, that in the way that we've insured against failure creates, creates a, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the phrase for a, a, a uh, risk? Moral, uh, a moral risk. Moral yeah. hazard. Yeah. Moral hazard. Yeah. 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 Creates a moral hazard. And it's very true in the credit card industry. Well, but, you know, to your point, um, we did have a legislative management of risk. Right? So there's a law that says that, you know, maximum, you're responsible for a maximum of $50, which, you know, all credit card companies have basically reduced to zero. Um, and so that forced the credit card companies to develop algorithms to detect fraud. So we, you know, we did have a, a particular solution for the way we were going to manage risk. Which and technology evolved yeah. to right. meet mm -hmm. that requirement. So any last questions? I have one for the panel and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, no? This is your big chance. Okay. Um, what would you do to, I do we have that one? He's oh. itching. Oh, oh, can we get the microphone? <laughs> Sorry. It's like the auctions where you accidentally buy yeah. something. <laughs> so everyone held very Sold still. to the man with the hat, uh, the new Banksy photo. Yeah. Uh, picture. Uh, uh, my name is Robert Farron. I'm a retired attorney and USCIS policy advisor. Um, I think this has been the most really enlightening I, uh, discussion. I, I haven't read the report yet, I just came here. But the, 
Uh, one of the things it points out is that, the, and Naomi touched on it, there's a different use for the Social Security card as you go through various um, types of activities and not necessarily as um, the identification card. Um, uh, it, it serves to give you money, it serves to validate the process of getting a Social Security card. Uh, so the question I have is really not just the Social Security card, but when you look at the risk, and I think the NIST approach, you have to look at the use case for each of these activities too. And one of the, one of the things that I, I, I really, uh, Naomi and I have had this discussion, but knowledge based, based upon the individual's knowledge, has to have some role in that. And I know that there's been criticism of the static knowledge based process, because that's a piece of data that's out there. But there can be and should be more developed a way that the individual can come up with a fluctuating pin or something that you know they, they would have control of. So every time, you know, I, I set up a I set up an algorithm and every time I use it. So I'm I'm wondering what the what you know, where does and we've had this discussion of the individual, where does individual knowledge fall in this process? And I'd be interested in the panelists' views. Um, so in our update uh, for 863-3, I mean, we were pretty um, clear about sort of the, you know, the, the lane for knowledge-based authentication. So for others out there that's, um, you know, asking questions that, you know, presumably only the individual knows the answer to, uh, you know, we certainly had concerns that with so many breaches of databases that, you know, that information which was supposedly only known to the individual is not the case. Um, so, you know, we recognize that as, you know, having a role, but, you know, we've kind of structured that to minimize, you know, mitigate some of those risks. I, I, I used to be a big fan of that stuff. You know, yeah, which of these phone numbers was associated with your youth? Um, uh, it's good as a one-time authenticator, right? Uh, uh, we use that at DHS in FEMA after a disaster, after a fraud, to establish, when you've lost all your documents, I can ask you which of these three phone numbers was from your youth, and you can tell me, and that's pretty unique. But as a persistent authenticator that's reusable, I, I, I always think anybody, uh, one of my favorite movies, because it's really a bad movie, was uh, 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 Now You See Me, right? The, the one with uh, 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 the guy who played Mark Zuckerberg in it and Woody Harrelson, right? And, and they're mocking their, uh, this guy and say, I bet you you're, 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 I, I can read your mind, you you're, you're had a dog named Ralph. And he says, no, it was Snuffles, bully boy. And of course, they, they're social, they're, they're yeah. Yeah. manipulating him and, and getting all of his passwords and then they steal hundreds of millions of dollars from him. So because knowledge is static, it's a one-time only thing, it's only good you know, for a short period of time. My view. Well, there are also multiple sources for that information. Yeah. Where if you think about where an individual might have made comments about the answers to those questions and you correlate those sources, you can get a pretty comprehensive view of an individual's profile. I think the basic answer is, if it's not something that nobody else knows at all, like the secret that you've kept in your heart for the last 60 years, then it's not, then it's not really secret. Yeah, my general theory is the, the Internet's overall effect has been to lower the cost of the acquisition of knowledge. Yeah. So over time, we're just going to have to get used to that, where it will be so easy to acquire knowledge about an individual or anything, that a knowledge-based approach is, has a finite lifetime here. But let me conclude with one final question for the panel. I think this has been a great discussion. Um, I love this subject, which is probably says something bad about me. But if you were going to do one thing to accelerate the move towards better identity, better authentication, what is that one thing you would do? And this is like my new thing: is what. What is it that's actually pragmatic that we could do in the next couple of years that would move the ball forward? It's been a hard problem in the U.S. You can dodge it, I suppose, although I'll be upset and cry for weeks. <laughs> do you, Naomi, do you want to go first? What's the one thing you'd do? Um, certification. So 
if we can, you know, get to certain standards and get a certification structure in place, um, I think that would allow uh, more trust and potentially an insurance um, business to, to develop. And, you know, I think some of those, you know, fears of businesses taking risks is, you know, there isn't, the one way we address that is, is through insurance. You know my answer. No. Right? Yes. We, we did, I did it in front of Congressman Johnson. I would publish every, every social security number linked to a name in a phone book. And then I would give everybody a cause of action against anybody who continues to use the social security number <laughs> as an authenticator. <laughs> okay. Candace, you get the last um, word. I actually, I actually like what Naomi said with a twist, and that is, if we could implement um, a system that allowed for the certification of uh, an auth authenticators of identity, right? Whether that be the government, whether that be, you know, like some of the other countries, the banks. I think was that Sweden. I think was leveraging yeah. the banks. Um, that does a couple of things. One, it gives people options. Two. It gives industry the opportunity to innovate around how we deliver that identity, whether it be in a smart card form or whether it be, you know, some form of advanced encryption capability or, or whatever. But, but it leaves room for creative solutions to be adopted over time and delivered by industry at large, but still with a root in a trusted certification mechanism. Great. Well, uh, please join me in thanking the panel, both the report and this video will be on. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Yeah.